Dear colleagues, welcome and many thanks for your participation. Today we speak about a sensitive matter, the institutional psychological harassment when work organization and pathogenic management push the victim to extremes with Marie Peset and Nicolas Villa. Marie Peset is doctor of psychology, psychoanalyst, former legal expert. She is head of the Souffrance et Travail Consultation Network and Maître Nicolas Villard from, from the L'Atelier des Droits, a law firm, lawyer at the Paris Bar, former staff representative and trade unionist. He followed the France Telecom case. This conference will be held in English and you can ask your questions in French. Cristiano Sebastiani, President of Renouveau et Democracy, will present our political and union position. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Digra, and many thanks to, to Marie and Eloy for, uh, for the presence. Um, uh, this conference is uh, one on a very long series of conferences that we have been organizing since uh, and now several months, but even in the past, uh, because we consider uh, that institutions, institutions must be in charge of this file with the highest possible level of expertise. Uh, too often we see people just uh, beginning, taking care of very serious file. Too often we, we deal with uh, some basic reflection. Uh, uh, someone is too, too lazy, sometimes is too weak. Someone else doesn't deserve to be part of the civil service. We are the lead, we have the excellence. And we saw more the, uh, um, a key like uh, only the weakest are those who, who can suffer. Uh, all this is really rubbish. It's totally not acceptable and not really uh, sustainable inside what is called the best possible civil service in the world. We must be able to show that it's also best in dealing with stuff, not only with files, not only with procedure. Uh, technocracy doesn't mean that you don't uh, take care of the human dimension of the work. Uh, we are not just puppets, we are not just uh, posts, we are not uh, credits, we are people. We, and we are a very particular kind of people because we are not just working, we are in a way serving a dream. We have decided to be part of something that is the European Union dream. And this kind of motivation, it can be really, uh, uh, are not set for our institution, but sometimes it becomes also a weakness for the staff, because if you think, if you trust what you do, if you think that you are part of a big project and you see things are not going properly well, you start thinking that you are as such not that useful, and then you start having concerns, burnout, and then you can even come to the, to the most dramatic decision that one can have in his life. Uh, today, we have also colleagues from Barcelona that are uh, connected with us, and uh, not only from other institutions and agencies. Uh, staff in Barcelona is actually facing a very dramatic situation. One of our colleagues asked him himself. And what we are here to do today is also to provide the best possible way to deal with this kind of situation. Uh, no one can just invent himself a specialist in this field. We have the best experts that are available with Marie, especially for the side of the psychological analysis, uh, uh, management, uh, toxic environment. We have the lawyer who has been following France Telecom. Every time that we face with a suicide, uh, everyone mentioned France Telecom. France Telecom seems to be the reference. Uh, no one seems to know exactly what was going on in France Telephone. They just mentioned from Telecom. We, we consider that it's very important for you to have a direct experience of the lawyer who has been following this case in order to provide staff in Barcelona, management in Barcelona, but also staff and management everywhere else for the best possible advice and opinion. Uh, we are following uh, with the staff, the family of the poor Mario. We are going to cover 
any possible aspect of the assistance that we are supposed to provide. And we are also here in order to take note of the question that at the end of the presentation of our expert, uh, you could eventually rise. Uh, we are also at the disposal of the staff after the meeting for a more bilateral conversation. Uh, and we are also here in order to, to ensure everyone that we will do the best possible effort in order to make clear what was really happening uh, for the poor Mario. Uh, I leave now the floor to, to Marie. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, you can send the, the question directly in the chat and we will uh, provide you with the, with the answer, English or French, as you wish. Marie. I'd like to thank you again for uh, receiving me and uh, all the team, our lawyer, but also Michael, uh, who is our inspector du, du travail and who's been uh, working on uh, all the jurisprudence. Uh, I'm going to give you the French point of view on um, uh, psychological harassment, which may be different from your point of view, because in France, the appearance of this notion in the years uh, 1995 um, had to do, in fact, for us, um, a clinician of work uh, had to do with a very strong increase of psychological disorder due to the organizational transformation and new management procedure. We knew that for decades when Marie France Irigoyen uh, published her famous book on the question. But I'd like to start first uh, by talking to you on what you told us a few minutes ago, Cristiano, that work is uh, totally irreplaceable as far as a, a personal and a social peacekeeper. Nothing can replace the job you have as far as your is concerned, your identity, the way you build your professional and personal identity, the way you wake up every day to feel useful and to go to the workplace and to try to meet people and to build a, a, a living together. So nothing can replace work when it is done in very good condition, but also nothing can replace work when it becomes toxic to put you to an end and to become uh, awfully um, dreadful. For a few decades, we must say that two currents of thoughts have opposed each other. The first one, as you know, goes toward the psychological explanation uh, narcissists, perverts have grown everywhere. I don't really know how. And um, this current, uh, of course, is talking about the psychological aspect of uh, the bad manager and the very nice employee. This is far too simple for us. And it goes to the naturalization of a phenomenon. We believe that the strong uh, changes that occurred in organizational pattern have totally upset the way we look at our job and the way, of course, we do it in the workplace. Maybe is it because in the early 90s, I received a, a lady from uh, La Défense, which is a suburb uh, where I used to, to work in the hospital of Nanterre, who brought me this uh, guideline of change management was so clearly saying that if you wanted employees to move very fast toward the new organization, you had only two ways of managing. You had to find charismatic manager, but apparently it's not that easy, or you had to um, frighten your employees so that they could move very quickly to your new way of working. And this um, guide was uh, extremely precise on the way you had to frighten your employees. And uh, you'll see later on in this presentation that uh, we made a guideline of the uh, harassment items. So, I'd like to spend a few minutes on the changes in the organization of work and their consequences on our health. Uh, as you know, for about two or three decades now, we know that the production of values is no longer to be sought 
in the work we do, but instead in the new management methods. And of course, in the quantity we produce at work. And uh, there's a lot of new semantic that we've called uh, novlong managerial, as so to speak, a new speak with all these new terms supposed to bring us um, inventivity and which are in fact a new way of talking of old matters disruption agility lean management digital native of course all these terms are not neutral at all and once again they are not makeover of old terms what do they serve to they define the reality of all the operational improvements that most firms and administration have put into place. They also create an incredible gap between the corporate governance of a firm or, or the administration and the grassroots worker who have to deal with what we call the real work. And of course, this vocabulary is like, uh, you know, um, gift paper. It euphemize, it neutralizes the very negative realities that are produced. And uh, it also creates a specific common vocabulary, an inside language inside the firm, inside the services, which makes you powerful if you master it and which loses you if you don't. Um, we must emphasize this terrible uh, trend of individualization of your work because you are um, interviewed, you are ranked, you are judged only by your individual work, which is a kind of a craziness because usually you work as a team, especially in the hospital, for example. Uh, we know also that this individualization as in the change man management guideline uh, puts on you quantified targets to be achieved. And of course, usually they are not achievable, which is a way to push you to do your best. There is also all the way of uh, giving you bonuses or a variable salary. There is also, of course, and we've seen that with the pandemic more than ever, the atomization of work tasks to the detriment of know-how profession, um, what works on the field, what allows the bridges to stand is the know-how of the people who build the bridge, not the Bureau des Méthodes uh, who tells you how to build it. Of course, we've been looking at the breakdown of workspaces, and um, this is a way to destroy uh, the team. You have also the new computer technology, which is inducing virtualization of your work. And this language, you need to be self-trained, you need to be proactive, you need to build your own skill, you need to become self-entrepreneur of yourself, which is a way to put all the guilt on your shoulders when you don't achieve your goals. And I'd like to spend a few minutes also on the quality, because we know that the roots of burnout and of many uh, suicides is the loss of the quality of work. When you do really a bullshit job, when what you do has no value according to your rules, your standards, but as only the quality of uh, as a commercial argument, then of course you do what we call work in a degraded uh, state, and this ruins your mental and physical health. I'm not going to spend time, of course, reading you the slides that will be sent to you and that you, you will have to have time to read. The communication, as I said before, is a way of um, asking you to be corporate, to invest your bodies and your mind in the service of business. And we know that all the influx of daily email makes it necessary to learn how to manage the hierarchy of these mails to respond very quickly, because if you don't respond to the first one, a few minutes later, the second one is coming. And that day and night, you're just overflowed with this mechanism and what is it look for and what is its aim it's just 
the way uh, the work organization prevents you from thinking, you have no time at all to make a step aside and to think about what you are doing and the way you are working. You are just the head in your work. And uh, this is the way they also prevent you from um, saying you don't agree with a new way of working. What are the consequences on the way uh, we behave and our, on our health of that type of work organization? First, we know that, and uh, I have to thank our Inspector du Travail, Michael Prieux, because they are uh, the one in our team that gives us every year the characteristic of a French organization. Workload everywhere is absolutely impossible to absorb. Then you have on you the complexity of a task, the time pressure, and of course, you work badly which is awful for your mental and physical health. Everywhere you have a lot of emotional requirement because you are uh, in contact with the public and the public is not happy with the way you work. Everywhere you have so many procedure that you lack completely of autonomy to do the job the way you want to do it. And of course, because you are alone, you have a lack of social support, and we know this is a tragedy as far as uh, preventing uh, risk of psychosocial is concerned. Of course, when you work that much, how do you reconcile your own private life and your professional life? It's impossible. You lose yourself. And uh, as I said a few minutes ago, this lack of recognition, this feeling of uselessness of the work done, which is a poor quality of work, uh, goes to a loss of meaning of the work you do, um, aims toward conflicts of value between the, what you've been asked to do and uh, of course your personal values, the way you want to work which causes ethical conflict. Uh, and as you can imagine, all this will create a lot of tension in the departments, um, isolating a, a little more all the employees. Um, in um, psychopathology of work, we divide the two families of pathology work-related uh, in between overload pathology and isolation pathology. As you can see toward the overload family of uh, problems, you have all these psychological side, stress, anxiety, disengagement from the work you don't like anymore, cognitive disorder increasing in uh, such an amount, acute stress, burnout syndrome. You have also violence, the violence of the employees against the users in between the colleagues or against the working tool by sabotage or against management. And you have manager who feel obliged to radicalize the way they manage to obey uh, what they are asked. And you have also all the somatic part musculoskeletal disorder, even with people working behind their uh, desk, uh, problem with your heart, stroke, uh, weight yo-yo, metabolic syndromes. Uh, I think the worst family is the last one, isolation. We know that in a situation of moral harassment, an employee will present what we call a PTSD, a post-traumatic stress syndrome, who is the, which is the specific syndrome presented by people being harassed. And we know that this isolation, when everybody looks at you from far away because you are a target, and if you are a target, then the other one are not. So they leave you in, alone with a toxic manager, um, is suicide, and we classify suicide with color. The black suicide is a suicide concerning someone who has previous pathological mental health issues, but even though you may have some fragilities, you can be pushed to suicide by the work situation. 
and we know how to analyze these type of um, clinical studies. You have what we call the red suicide, which is the one that spreads so increasingly and so uh, impossible in France Telecom with so many uh, suicides. Uh, I'm going to kill myself. And then the hier hierarchy, the management, the direction will understand something is wrong and will modify the situation. Uh oh, what uh, a terrible way of losing your life because nothing changes after you kill yourself. And uh, I must say the silence is even thicker afterwards. And the white suicide, which is the one concerning the people who have burnout syndrome, they just don't want to die. They are not sad, they are not depressed. They just want to rest. And so it's necessary to understand and to be able of acknowledging this type of risk in a work organization to do real good prevention. In France, psychosocial risks are defined with a very interesting and uh, intelligent definition. Risks to mental, physical, social health generated by employment condition, organizational, interpersonal factors that may interact with mental functioning. As you can see, the official definition in France doesn't talk at all about fragile employees. And we use, of course, the Karazak uh, model, which is used everywhere in the world, and which uh, uh, leads to putting you in one of these uh, different square. I must say that nowadays, uh, according to the way we all work, we are all in the red square in job strain. We are all asked with a very high demand and uh, we have very, very low latitude. And we all lack of support since we are all alone, even if in a team. So what do uh, French law says about psychological harassment? Uh, this is interesting to compare between France and uh, the European civil service. In France, the French legal definition says no employee shall be subjected to repeated acts of psychological harassment, which has as their object or effect a deterioration in working condition, which could infringe his rights and dignity, impair his physical or mental health and compromise his professional future. I'm not again going to spend a lot of time. I'm just going to show you the um, jurisprudence um, because I think our uh, judges have done a very great work. Of course, in France, as everywhere, the free conditions are necessary to characterize a situation as a moral harassment one. How many repeated conducts, as you can see, two may suffice, not 2,000, two. And apart of um, two weeks or three years, one from the other, this is important because this is very far from what people think the definition of harassment is. What about the nature of a conduct? We'll go more precisely on the defi definition later uh, in this PowerPoint. No employee, which means that vertical, horizontal psychological harassment um, must be condemned but the perpetrator doesn't have to be the line manager or even in the company, but can be a person linked to the work. Uh, of course, as you know, in the French law, um, we remove the, the intentionality, the purpose. Uh, any one of us can be uh, harassing someone without knowing and without wanting to do so. Um, likely to cause harm, which means it's not necessary to be half dead to uh, put a file uh, on someone uh, for a moral harassment. The potential harm is sufficient. And uh, once again, we'll go later on what is exactly the infringement of rights, dignity, health, and the professional future. 
the judges have rejected totally the argument that there is uh, the necessity of having international in, intentional element of the elephants. Uh, this is important, as well as they have ruled on the potential damage. And as well as in France, we have reversed the burden of proof. The employee is supposed to present facts suggesting the existence of psychological harassment. He doesn't have to prove anything. And uh, this adjustment of the burden of proof, you will read it, is uh, quite at uh, work in the uh, administration. Um, what is interesting is that there is a thousand rulings per year in our court of cassation. Uh, that means they work a lot on this situation. And uh, the hopeful um, new is that in broad terms, there is 80% of conviction. So when you, um, you want to talk about your moral harassment, you have 80% of winning in front of a justice. Um, I, I will go over the penalty of two years because this is not very interesting. Of course, the classification of the different types, the different form of harassment is important. We may say that concerning the individual harassment, you have a lot of obsessive personality more than narcissist. Uh, I remember this secretary who had to uh, put the stamp at four millimeter of the border of the envelope and the manager used to check with a rule to verify if he re she respected the four millimeters. And I know that in higher um, position, the obsessive personality makes its way. You have also this type of people who like to humiliate destroy the other. Uh, of course, these people wouldn't have any power if um, administration, the top management, the direction was doing uh, her job and preventing this type of harassment from happening. You have this type of harassment, which I think is the most invisible one. Uh, it is carried out between staff, between teams, with no hierarchical relationship. And it's in fact a collective dynamic in which um, um, a team in very poor situation, totally in burnout, may want to um, use a scapegoat. One of the member of a team who is going to bear the responsibility for all the bad situation and who is going to be ejected of a team. And the management and direction have to be very careful on identifying this type of horizontal harassment. And you have also the one that is concerned today, the institutional harassment, which can take uh, three different uh, forms. Deliberate management practices, involving the disruption of a social re relationship, which will affect all staff, which will undermine the dignity of the people and uh, damage their work condition and of course their mental and physical health. You will have strategic harassment, which aims at getting <laughs> rid of uh, seniors, of the younger ones, of the um, handicapped ones, uh, the ones whose level of training doesn't any longer correspond to the needs of a service, and you get rid of them with this little dirty way of managing. You have also a management without any intentionality, but the methods promote conflict, promote too much um, uh, benchmark between the employees. Uh, this in institutional harassment occurs, not only when management wants it to occur, but it occurs when the whole or, or operational um, institution doesn't fit the needs of the employee. Um, and of course, this position is in line with the legal uh, definition. Uh, in France, we've seen since the law in 2002, many, many cases law, uh, which have been taking the view that work organization 
management techniques, restructuring could, uh, on account of their impact, characterize the offense of psychological harassment. And as you can see, it is our everyday situation at work, public humiliation, isolation, systematic monitoring of work at all time, professional downgrading, removal from duties, failure to take a decision on the part of management in the face of known relation, relational problem, excessive workload, repeated omission and errors. All this is exactly what we are going through every, everywhere as far as France is concerned. So we can say that the organizational harassment is present, unfortunately, almost everywhere here in the police, in the hospital, as far as the um, uh, school is concerned also. And here you have a whole lot of jurisprudence about uh, psychological harassment on his organizational um, side. I'm gonna go over all this, the way we punish people, the way we are supposed to protect victims and witnesses. Uh, I will come back with uh, Maître Viar later on on France Telecom. I I'm gonna try to tell you how in France, as far as the expert on psychological aspect, try to make um, a diagnosis as far as harassment is concerned. On the international psychological literature about psychological harassment, we know that there is a specific clinical syndrome that can be identified and that can be a proof that the harassment exists. It is the PTSD and PTSD in its alert phase, of course, is very hard to diagnose because ah, it's subclinical. Everybody can present anxiety, sleep disorder, boredom, addiction. Uh, and uh, most of the time, the employee in this phase will not express himself or herself. Of course, he won't speak at all to the colleagues. He will try to hold and he will develop an hypervigilance at work to do better, to do so good that the criticism will stop. He will be in a hyperactivity supposedly avoiding criticism and bullying. And uh, it is very, very hard to identify this phase, but very, very quickly, the decompensation phase will occur and you will have this incredible distress of the RAS patient who goes to work with tachycardia, tremors, sweating, usophageal lump, and the recurring unwanted look back of work threatening. They are in front of their desk, in front of their computer, and suddenly um, the dispute that happened the day before, the humiliation in front of the team uh, imposes itself in front of the screen and they cannot work any longer. They are just uh, reliving the scene. Distress attacks occurs also spontaneously. And this patient tells you, I was in the street and suddenly someone having the perfume of my manager went by and um, the panic attack uh, was awful. I had to go back to my home. You have also this horrible nightmare. I remember this patient um, who was dreaming that she was naked um, at the workplace with her hands tight uh, in her back, um, losing control of her sphincter, and with all the team passing by, totally indifferent to her suffering. Can you imagine this type of nightmares and why people, of course, wake up in sweats and screaming? You will have also reaction on insomnia to try to block this intrusive nightmare. And as you can imagine very, very quickly, People, we go down to a major social, emotional, sexual withdrawal with alteration of their uh, mental and physical health. They will have a lot of cognitive impairments, loss of memory, trouble concentrating, trouble thinking. So you can imagine how many mistakes they are going to make, which are going to lead to more criticism. 
And of course, we are going to lose self-esteem. We are going to feel so valueless. We are going to feel so guilty. What have I done to deserve the way I'm treated? And they are going to keep on justifying men themselves. And of course, if this situation lasts too long, and if nobody interfere as far as the management or um, all the persons concerned, uh, if no one moves and does anything, you will have paroxystic distress and suicidal raptors. And uh, who's concerned? Not the fragile worker. It is the one we call the sentinel, the one who has very strong values about the way he does his job. And if he feels trapped in the work situation, he may want to free himself or herself by committing suicide. The question you must ask when you are in that uh, type of situation, how is the rest of the team? How are doing the other people? This is important because you have to look at this type of uh, pathology in a systemic way. And of course, you will have all the somatic attacks and mainly for uh, women um, uh, problems on the gynecological uh, uh, area with uh, even cancers uh, on this field. Um, we decided that it was time to give you uh, all the tools we've been building with our team of lawyers, inspectors du travail, judges who are uh, reuniting uh, for about 20 years uh, around me. Um, this is a very useful guideline um, which can help oneself to identify if he is or not in a harassment situation. Of course, as you will see, the way we try to look at this item goes totally through what we call the prerogative of uh, the, uh, the chief, of the manager in chief. You have a relationship, a relationship of subordination and how it can be overused to have power on you or to isolate you. So it's very useful to ask yourself, um, are they using against me a very familiar form and I'm not supposed to uh, do it in the other way? Are they interrupting me systematically when I try to talk? Are they using against me a high and threatening verbal level? Are they uh, forgetting all the social etiquette? Nobody says you hello, goodbye, or thank you any longer. Uh, even people don't talk at you any longer. And uh, the evaluation interview is used to totally uh, uh, destabilize you uh, emotionally. You may have also isolation practices. Uh, your meal schedulers change so that you cannot go with your colleagues. Uh, they don't give you information on the meeting and then they criticize you because you haven't been there or they don't give you communication on meetings necessary to your performance at work, and then they criticize your work. Of course, when they order the other employees not to talk to you, there you reach the bottom of isolation. And uh, if nobody has the courage uh, to try to break that, then you're in a bad shape. How do you create clans where well, you are very nice with some, very rigorous with others? You distribute the job with very unequal workload. You put on benchmarks so that people are in competition and you stigmatize an employee in front of others so that everybody knows that if they don't obey, they will have to go through the same situation. What about the disciplinary power? Uh, it can become persecutory and uh, it, it is also, also a punitive practice. If you monitor fact and gesture, mainly through uh, cameras and um, uh, computer device, of course, it's asphyxiating. 
if you control the communication uh, of the phones, of the email, if you ask for uh, permanent reporting, if you check bags, drawers, racks, bins, if you check the length of breaks, the absence all the time, the conversation with the colleagues, if you oblige people to leave the door open so can, I can see if you work, <laughs> can you imagine how you feel in that type of situation? Uh, the punitive practices like refusing to give you your training requests, evaluating your work with very bizarre procedure, uh, giving you systematic memos or disciplinary meetings or venial events or assigning you in a very um, harsh way to this department and no other one or giving you or not the holidays at the last moment all this of course um, puts in a disciplinary atmosphere which is unbearable uh, very very quickly but maybe the worst of all the technique are these one the one that are going to um, affect your working gesture the way you need to give sense and meaning to the job you make the way you want um, your personality to be recognized through the good job you are making so if your work is too sequenced if you don't see the final product, it's harmful. If you work at the edge of illegality, it's harmful. If you are obliged to apply quality standards, but not your business rule, your ethical rules, it is harmful. And of course, maybe the, the worst one or these ones, the paradoxical injunction. You make redo a task that all has already been done elsewhere or you correct non-existent fault, or you tear a report that was absolutely necessary at nine o'clock in the morning, that is useless at 5 p.m. Or uh, the question of the stems glued four millimeter from the edge of the envelope. Uh, and as you can see, setting objective without giving the means, which is after all exactly the way we work every day is a paradoxical injection and we accept to do that because we're so concerned by our job we want things to be done so we don't object that the objective are unreachable you can also stage the disappearance which is i think a psychological murder you remove task to assign them to someone else and you don't inform the employee. You block access to the office, telephone, computer. You delete the employee from the organization chart or letterhead. You give work that doesn't correspond to the qualification. The message you send is you're here, you're not here, we don't care. Why don't you go away through the door? This is really a psychological murder. You can also, of course, lead to burnout syndrome by setting unachievable targets, which will maintain every one of us in a permanent state of failure. And of course, uh, bound to be criticized all the time since we cannot reach the target, which also will increase the workload in a given time frame. And um, when you submit uh, the urgent file, always at the last minute, um, I must say that this, these three um, criterion are the three that conduct to um, uh, art disease in the different research of uh, uh, cardiologists in America and in uh, Japan. As you can see, all these management practices versus rules of law. And uh, we always give the advice to the employee to use this term instead of trying to speak or write with a lot of emotional emphasis about what they are going through. You have to talk about vexatious sensibility, refusal to engage in dialogue, insidious remarks, and justify sanction. Um, it is necessary to be um, equipped with strong tools when you want to um, 
be effective in the way you show uh, exactly what you are going through. Maybe it's time now that uh, I let uh, Nicolas Via tell you um, about France Telecom, this uh, exemplary judgment which knowledge of institutional psychological harassment. And of course, Michael Prieux can, can talk also if he wants to add anything. Thank you for listening. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, before I'm gonna read what's on the, on the PowerPoint, I'd like to make a, a few elements, give you a few elements of context, uh, why France Telecom judgment is so extraordinary. Uh, I think first it's extraordinary by the scale of things in the judgment, the scale is completely crazy. Okay, it's, if you take the if you take the judgment in itself, the decision, it's over 340 pages, which is in itself completely uh, out of proportion. What exactly happened with France Telecom? France Telecom, historically speaking, is a public institution uh, dealing with the telephone communications and uh, in France. In, in the year 2000, it's around 150,000 workers, 150,000 workers. That's a lot of people working for one company. Um, at that time, France Telecom is a public institution. It's state owned. The, the French state owns the company. What happens, two major changes happen in 2004. In 2004, the company, France Telecom, is privatized. Okay, uh, so there's a movement from public to private. That's the first thing. The second thing is in 2004, there's a technology uh, evolution from telephone lines, what we traditionally know as hardline telephones, to um, cell cellular phones and other um, uh, computer technology that happened since. Um, what happened is that at that point, 80% of the France Telecom staff is what we call fonctionnaire, public service, public servants, public agents, whatever you want to call them. They're public workers working for the state. And as such, they cannot be just, their contracts cannot be terminated according to what we call in France, licenciement économique. Okay, so the employer France Telecom, who has now become a private employer cannot just dismiss his 150,000 workers from one day to another by saying we have economic problems. That's not possible because uh, these workers are uh, public workers. So what happens? The company senior management has to figure out or figures out a way to get rid of the people. And that's what France Telecom case is all about. It's nothing else. It's just about numbers, about euros, about dollars, about money, about how much money we can save on how many people we can kick out of the company. And the numbers are crazy. I said 150,000. In 2005, six, seven, there are 100, around 100,000 people. And at that time, the management of France Telecom decides they have to get rid of 22,000 people. 22,000 people, that's a lot of people. That's over 20% of the staff of France Telecom. And the number 22,000 people, to get to that number, they're just gonna harass people. And that's where the France Telecom decision is new, okay? Because before France Telecom, before the decision in 2019, the Cour de Cassation, so the French Supreme Court, in its uh, labor chambers or criminal chambers, had already judged that um, managing techniques, management could be harassing concerning one person, one worker. France Telecom, the new, the novelty is that they're going to decide that um, a company's policy, a company's policy. Uh, aiming hundreds and thousands of workers can be in itself harassment. And that's where the term institutional harassment arrives. The novelty with France Telecom is that from this day, harassment does not have to be between two people, a manager and a worker. It can be 
put together by the company towards the collectivity of the workers. Scientifically. Yeah, scientifically. I, I would even add industrial in an industrial manner. Before, before France Telecom, harassment was a question of one against one, the manager against one of the employees. France Telecom has made uh, uh, harassment, has taken harassment to an industrial level, making it a company's policy. And that's what it is. And that's what the judgment says. The judgment is new in that regards that it creates, it acknowledges what the court itself called institutional psychological harassment. And for that, the court identified a legal element um, and identified three conditions for that legal element to be constituted. First, there has to be a structured and implemented enterprise policy, okay? Now here today, I'm not gonna get, go into the detail of how the policy is implemented. I, I, I recommend, I strongly recommend you read the judgment. This is the judgment. This is this enormous piece of, this is crazy. You have it in here. I'm not gonna develop here because it would take hours. And I'd rather you hear Marie Pose uh, on the medical questions because the medical questions concerned everybody. Okay, I'm just, talking on the legal aspect and that's very Franco-French, that's very local. I do not know, I do not have, uh, know the rules applying is in Spain or even inside the commission. So I would rather we go back to Marie Pose to listen what she has to say on a medical level because to that everybody can relate. The second con condition for institutional harassment is the actions leading to de deterior deterioration. And again, I have to, to, to say again that the deterioration of the working conditions can be actual or potential, okay? In, in, um, in France, in, in the French uh, code, there's the word susceptible. Susceptible means likely. So um, that gives a, a, a big margin for the, the workers to act. And the third condition is the exceed the power of management, okay? Um, the workers, sorry, the defendants in France Telecom as the defendants in all the cases of har harcèlement moral, always defend themselves saying, no, but I was within the limits of my power as a leader, as a director. I was in the limits of my power as a manager. Okay, that's, so that's one of the conditions which are important. The, the acts, the les agissements réitérés, so the actions which are repeated have to, be, have to be exceeding the power of management. So they, they you have to see, in, in France Telecom, the, what happened is, is, is completely crazy. I mean, to kick people out, France Telecom would, um, what would they do? They would just, take the seats out of the offices. So you would, a worker would get on Monday morning to his office and he had no place to sit. And th that's the situation so extreme as that would be used to get rid of people. And the managers would get bonuses according to how many people they got kicked out, which is another um, uh, structured and implemented enterprise policy. Concerning the intention, Marie Pizet talk, talk, talked about it a little bit. Um, uh, the willingness to carry out repeated actions, either by knowing their effect or by knowingly seeking their object is, is, is looked for, but that does not mean that the, the offender intends to get to the results. Okay, so it's a, there's a question of intention. Of course, the, in the foster income judgment, in the decision, there's a, many, many, many pages on that question. Is there real intention or not? And then in that judgment, the defendants were, uh, were judged guilty. So four months uh, of uh, fixed imprisonment with a, a, a big fine and 75,000 euro fine for the company itself. Okay, now um, for the rest concerning that judgment, I think lawyers have to be very humble. Okay, because uh, the, um, the managers, the senior management of Foster Decom, um, is making an appeal on that decision. So maybe the Court of Appeal of Paris will reverse the decision, but for the moment, 
they were all condemned, the company and the seven directors of France Telecom. Voilà, Marie Bézé. Yes. Uh... Marie, um, do you hear me? Yes, I hear yeah. you. Yeah, because I, I, I'm getting messages from my colleagues from Barcelona. Uh, and I mean, they are really uh, thank you for uh, what, what we do today. But I also understand that they would like to have a few focus information about how one can deal with the case of suicide. And especially uh, perhaps for Nicola, how legally speaking, the internal investigation that will start in a few days, so it's actually more or less in place, what we consider, uh, despite the, the fact in Barcelona that are going to be looked by, by the, the investigation, but uh, as a best practice, how an internal investigation must be organized when it comes to dealing with a suicide. Okay, okay. Um, I'm not really the right guy to talk about this, okay? Maybe this sounds strange, but I'm not really the right guy. I, I've never worked for the police, okay? So I've never done any inquiry like that with the suicide. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Nicola, I'm not speaking about the police investigation. I'm just dealing with how the employer is organized. It's an internal investigation. The employer? The internal. The internal investigation inside, yeah. inside the agency, in this case, but inside... Uh, any other entities. I mean. Excuse me, Cristiano, the investigation by who? By the workers' representatives or the... In oh, by some independent investigators with the participation of one staff representative. Well, oh, um, I don't know. I can't really answer that because I, I don't... I've, I've not worked with private investigators. Uh, I've worked with uh, person auditing companies on demand of the workers' representatives. So, well, I think the, the basic thing is that any investigation has to be totally neutral. And that's, I think that's the first element to uh, select the investigators. Where do they come from? Who do they know? Who pays them? What is the mission? Uh, neutrality is absolutely central here. And the second thing, um, our Inspector du Travail, Michael Prieur, told us about this a, a couple of days ago. I think the first thing is um, to seek the facts, to look for the facts, to identify the facts, to identify the causes. What led to the accident? What led to the event? Not looking for responsibility. Yeah. Okay, I think that's, a, the, the, if you have those two, Two rules. If if uh, the the inquiry follows those two rules, I think you're you're pretty good. You you can uh, you can have good work. Uh, but I think I have to emphasize not looking for responsibilities, establishing the facts. Uh, the guilty one. Voilà. Not, voilà. Uh, establishing the responsibility is another work. It's something else. It comes later. Normally, if the work has been done correctly, of establishing facts establishing the timeline, what happened, how did that happen, what was said. Uh, I hear there was a meeting on a Friday afternoon, April 30th. Who was there? What was said? What were the reactions? How did the meeting end? All those things, we're not talking about responsibility, individual responsibilities. We're talking about facts. And from the facts, usually, responsibility comes. I, I think that's the, the two rules you have to follow for any inquiry in your situation. If you look for a scapegoat, yeah. you will have a second suicide. Yeah. So you don't look for someone guilty of what happened. You look at all the uh, succession of facts that led to this tragedy. Okay, and Maria, I have also a question for you. What must be done uh, for assisting the colleagues, those who were working with the victim, uh, which, the, which the march must be put in place, is there any uh, consolidated strategy, which items must be organized? What you about the guideline made by the CUMF in France? Professor Croc is a general uh, of the medical military emergency 
and they made a, a great guideline for um, very rare and traumatic event in the workplace. You have it on our website, of course, and you can uh, get it. And it says absolutely perfectly what to do, who to try to reach to, what to say to the press. You have what you call the implicated one. You have the witnesses. You have different levels of employee that will feel concern. And um, of course, just putting on a psychological brain phone line will not be enough. This is easy to put on. You have really to try to put back a reunification of a team. This is what will help people to heal from what happened. To put them together, services by services, so that we can talk, if possible, of course. And if you have that in Spain, to uh, work psychologists who are used to that type of uh, tragedy, unfortunately. But this is necessary. You know, there's nothing like a talking cure, mm -hmm. but a free talking cure, mm -hmm. not a phone line uh, talking cure to uh, for for a few amounts of uh, minutes. Let people really say how sorry and sad we must be and guilty, because um, if um, the verb um, the words are not used the guilt is going to be put back as um, an unbelievable cover, <laughs> mm. a cover mm. and a very thick one. And it's going to get thicker and thicker. And uh, everybody is going to have um, uh, sleep problems and guilt problems. If I had known, I would have done this earlier. I should have down and or said that when I saw him in the in the hall. Um, let's remember maybe as he was feeling trapped, Mario uh, freed himself. Mm. Even if it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. I think that is uh, really what our colleagues, uh, uh, not only in Barcelona, because we are facing, uh, um, fortunately, another case of suicide in Ispra, if it is even not directly linked to the, to the work, and we have already been facing other uh, case. Um, um, I would like just to ask you, how can we deal with this uh, dramatic and uh, really disgusting approach mentioning uh, at the end of the story, we are still in the average of the case of suicide. This is an interesting uh, statistic question. Because in France, with all the suicide of interns in our hospital, uh, our hospital directors are the same. Oh, it's a totally normal amount of suicide. No. Uh, the suicide in the workplace have to be analyzed statistically just like the suicide in prison, which means in closed space. So it cannot be related to the normal uh, average of uh, suicide in, in the population. So one suicide on the workplace, once again, it's the suicide of a sentinel of the apparent part of the iceberg. How are the other one doing and dealing with what's going on? And if you don't do something when it happens, someone will rise up the upper and part of the iceberg and kills oneself once again. So you have to treat this phenomenon uh, in a systematic way. That's why we use the term of um, uh, psychopathology of collective violence when we speak about this type of suicide. There is a, a very different way of uh, analyzing the reason why someone is committing suicide when it's related to workplace. It's a way of saying something for everyone. Remain silent. Thank, thank you very, very much for your, uh, for your suggestion. And I, I got many messages from the colleagues. So thank you both for what you have been saying so far. Um, I'm also, 
I'm also ensuring the colleagues, and not only in Barcelona, uh, that on top of this general, uh, that is not even so general because we are we are going through some specific items linked to suicide. We are going also to provide the full assistance with our lawyers to not only to the family of Mario, but also eventually to the to the administration should they wish that. Uh, because I mean, I suppose that they are also lost. They have no experience in this field. So all the information that we have all today put on the table, the reference to the instruction manuals and others are totally at their disposal, should they think that can be useful to, to, to take that on board. Uh, finally, we are also, and that also guarantee that we are also putting all possible pressure on the commission to provide the full assistance to the agency not only towards the list of potential investigators, but also having a look at what is going on, uh, because the commission is not just uh, some, somewhere else. The commission is sitting on the board. The commission has a full political responsibility of what is going on in the different agencies. Uh, we have also asked the commissioner on human resources and his cabinet to, to follow the file. We have also asked colleagues and director from the IDOC to do it. I know that uh, colleagues from Olaf uh, that were so helpful in dealing with harassment in the social economic uh, comedy are also today with us. Uh, so we are really putting all possible uh, measures at the disposal of the colleagues and institutions. So several institutions are today with us. And the first thing that we, we really want to do is to put at their disposal the best possible expert. You have seen several times to mention the situation in France, uh, but the France is also what has inspiring our reform of the self-regulation when it comes to, to deal with harassment. The definition of harassment in our self-regulation, I was at the table at that time, was really inspired by France. Uh, I know that our internal investigation has quite often taken into account what is going on in France, a low case decision. Uh, for example, the principle that you don't need to want to be an harasser for being guilty is exactly what has been also retained by the Court of Justice. And is also what was retained in the investigation uh, social economic uh, committee. I mean, all this is part of sort of uh, uh, key that we are going to, to deal with that, uh, and we, we will keep on doing that. So sorry for having interrupted interrupt you for your presentation, but I got so many messages and suggestions from the colleagues that I think that they deserve it to get your answer. Okay. Uh, you know that in France, we also do, uh, when there is a suicide, what we call um, autopsy psychic. Autopsy? Yeah which means we gather all the uh, medical documents, files of the person who killed her, herself, to analyze all the eventual mental problems she had before or not, mm -hmm. and to analyze, uh, thanks to the files of the uh, work doctor, uh, when it started to become very difficult, when the person went to see the work doctor to complain about was, what was happening, um, the way we build, rebuild uh, the pathway to suicide uh, in reverse um, line guide, timeline, is very interesting because it gives very precise um, facts and uh, times, weeks, years went worse and nobody moved, nobody did what he should have done, nobody made a real primary prevention. And uh, you see all the missed uh, virage, all the missed turning that should have been taken at the right moment and uh, who could have prevented the hand. So this is very interesting to work only on the medical file, private one, and the work files. Yeah, and perhaps it is also uh, very helpful what Nicolas was mentioning about France Telecom, this sort of cultural crash within a public service and a private uh, way to deal with uh, as a manager. And is exactly what we are uh, uh, quite often uh, facing in the agency. 
Uh, the director of the agencies came quite often from the private sector. Uh, he just discovered what is a staff regulation. Uh, sometimes it, it, it takes time to, to understand, sometimes he just refuse it, uh, like a symbol of the bureaucracy, of a not really efficiency, waste of time. Uh, and they pretend to deal with a public entity, a public body, a, a new institution like a private firm, and to decide whatever themselves or herself. Uh, to impose uh, what is called the uh, loi de silence. Uh, we are dealing, I'm, I, I'm not just referring to Barcelona, we are dealing with all, all, all the agencies. Uh, la, last week, there was a, an article in the political newspaper about another agency on which the director has imposed the loi de silence. Everyone must say hello, uh, yes to everything. If you are not happy, you, you can just get rid of your job. You must be happy that you have your job. I look around you. Other people would like to get your post. I mean, all this uh, bunch of uh, slogans. Uh, and it, it is sometimes difficult because they, I wouldn't say always, but sometimes they act in good faith. They consider that they have a mission and they consider that the staff regulation and the bureaucracy, the procedure are totally ineffective. And in order to get what they are supposed to get, they must get rid of the rules and the procedure. And it's not that easy to challenge this way of working, especially if someone else yep. somewhere else is not strong enough mm. for recalling to him oh. to her that is there in order to be a director of a new institution. Uh, on your experience, how can oh, we try oh. to find uh, the, the balance between uh, this kind of a private mentality, uh, that is a distortion of a private mentality, and the need to respect and to follow the public rules for a, a public body institution? We need to take our time and not to think that you can change things in one second or in a few weeks. The way people work is totally embodied in what we call procedural memories. They are neurophysiological memories. When you do your work task many millions of time, you work by body. You don't have to think. And uh, you know it by heart and by body. And you don't change these procedural uh, body memories in a couple of weeks. So you, you need to give time to people so that eventually we change. And you need to think also that maybe you are not right in the way you manage. Yeah. And there is a, an error de casting sometimes <laughs> that must be redressed. <laughs> okay, um, I, I just want to let you know one of the comments is the one of the most useful and supportive event I have ever attended. Congratulations for having organized it and to the speakers. So, I mean, credit to you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that we are now running uh, at the end of the meeting. Um, what I just wanted to confirm to all the colleagues is not just one shop event. I mean, it's a, by far a series of events that we are organizing with Marie and uh, with Nicola now. <clears throat> and uh, we, we are now really proud to be uh, with them. Uh, we know that also the administration of different institutions are really grateful for the hints, the information. I know, Marie, that. Uh, some of our best managers are looking at your website, uh, looking at, uh, at all information. Uh, and uh, I always invited them to, to, to get in contact with, uh, with your site and to get all this information because it's important. I mean, our job is not to, to make a war. Our job is to help our institution to work better, but also to be quite strong when, when things are going wrong. I mean, the message must pass that uh, no one can pretend to do whatever he or she wish. They are procedure, they are sanction, they are investigation and everything must be done properly in a good way. Uh, we are going to organize other events on that. Uh, and again, aside of this general conference, we are providing assistance to the colleagues in Barcelona. Uh, Marie and uh, Nicola are also there in order to support uh, our own lawyers that they are going to support the family for the internal investigation. Uh, for us, it's crucial to have a clear cut analysis of facts. A responsibility will come after. Uh, 
is important facts and then it's also important to take on board uh, what is the the mood of the rest of the staff uh, that is not that positive things are not going properly uh, things must change and we are also here in order to help the administration in order to improve things but we are also here in order to to make strong denunciation if things are not changing. I mean, and to ask the commission to intervene because the commission is not a witness. The commission is a major actor on this, this, in this respect. And it's important also that the commission will take its own responsibility and we hope and we trust the commission to do it. So thank you very, very much to, to all the colleagues who have attended this meeting and uh, get in touch for the rest. All the slides and documents are going to be given to to the to the staff uh, and then uh, thank you thank you very much by the bottom of my heart bye bye see you bye. soon bye bye